Welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and is shown nationwide. The topic for today's show is the NHL. For hockey fans, hockey isn't a game. It's a way of life. There have been great players like Gordie Howe, Bobby Orr, and Wayne Gretzky. Hockey has given its fans great moments. One of the most memorable is when a group of college students from the USA defeated the mighty Russian Olympic team, also known as the Miracle on Ice. The NHL has produced great teams, such as the Big Bad Bruins, for which Derek Sanderson, Mike Milbury, and Ken Hodge played. And who could forget the high-flying Edmonton Oilers of the 1980s? Plus, hockey has one of the most successful franchises in sports history, the Montreal Canadiens. In an effort to get as many perspectives as possible, we thought it would be a great idea to get the thoughts of a man who knows the game, from a player's view as well as from management view. We visited with Michael Milbury in New York. Mike was a top defenseman with the Boston Bruins. After retiring, he progressed through the Bruins organization, from player to head coach of the Bruins affiliate, the Mariners, where his team captured the division title and he was named Coach of the Year. Mike then became head coach and assistant general manager of the Bruins, leading the team to division titles. Mike then became the general manager of the New York Islanders. Mike, tell us a little bit about the game of hockey. How has it changed over the course of your career, first as a player? Well, it's changed in a whole lot of different ways, from the, just from the size of the players, who are so much bigger, so much stronger, so much faster than they've ever been. And, uh, and that makes for a whole different set of uh, rules for coaches to live by. And they, the coaches have adapted incredibly to the game. And now we're much more, uh, they're much more sophisticated in terms of positioning and technical play uh, makes for a real challenge for of an opposing coach when you come into a new building mm -hmm. and, and they've seen everything that you're going to do. And from the business perspective, it's uh, incredibly different. It's, um, there's all sorts of things that go on in an arena during the course of the game, advertising, even here in this little rink that you're seeing, everything that you can possibly imagine on the yeah. sideboards, uh, and of course the money is uh, hugely different. Do you think in any way it's becoming a game or it's going to become a game of speed and, and size and strength as opposed to technical skill? You know, we're, we're facing a time now where teams have become so uh, detail-oriented and they play the trap, which is yeah. a real tight defensive system. I don't know how we're going to get around that. It's, there's still a lot of excitement to the game. There's a lot of transition off this defense. But a lot of us are concerned about what it's doing to the flow of the game. So it's something that we're looking at, and especially with the new CBA around the corner, we're looking at it very intently in the next year or so. So we'll have to stay tuned and see what happens. Yeah, I think so. But, uh, but every year, there's probably three or four general managers' meetings. Most of the managers are ex-players, but all of them are dramatically interested in the welfare of the game. And we're always looking for a way to make it better. And we get input from the players as well. So. I, I think the game should be flow, excitement, and that's its roots. Its, uh, its essence was on rivers and ponds and where there was just an explosion of energy and speed. And, and the more we can keep that essence of the game, the better it is for all of us. Do you believe that the fighting or the violence is an essential part of the games? Is that what viewers want to see? Well, that's two different questions. Uh, I don't believe that the, the fighting is an essential part of the game. I believe that we've allowed it to become a part of the marketing aspect mm -hmm. of the game. Um, no other major sport allows it to occur in its, uh, in, in its field, and I don't think we need it. Um, other people will argue that this is a way to, to, to people police themselves on yeah. the ice. Uh, I frankly think that's a sales pitch, and I think we could easily do without it and make the game uh, better because of it. But, um, you know, I'm in the minority on that one, and I'm not, I'm not that, I mean, I fought plenty of times when I was a player. It's not that I'm uh, a pacifist in any way, shape, or <laughs> no form. Way. But I, uh, I think we, it's time to move on. That's right. Let me ask you a somewhat related question. Hockey players are rarely in trouble with the law or in trouble far less than other athletes. Why do you think that's so? You know, we've had the, we've been lucky to, to uh, in many ways, unlucky, I guess. The salaries have been low. They haven't been introduced into the fast lane. 
a lot of us that are very concerned about that. I mean, we've had a recent episode with uh, a tragic episode yeah. where where uh, one of our, our players in Atlanta passed away. And it was a fairly innocent uh, occurrence, you know, somebody driving a little too fast. But it's, it's when you introduce the opportunity and all the money that comes with it, it's something that concerns me. But up until now, it's been sort of a down-to-earth group. And, and I guess maybe that Maybe most of the time people are coming from Canada. Forty percent of our players are still from Canada, but it's a kind of a, an earthy game, and the guys are generally well grounded. And uh, I hope we never lose that entirely. I wonder if you might comment on the diversity now in the league. You said still forty percent of the players are coming down from Canada, but where's everyone else coming from? Well, there's uh, they're coming from everywhere. I mean, we have people from Long Island now that are playing in the league. We have people from the Midwest, of course, and, and all across uh, uh, Europe. Uh, the, Russian, the Russian system, which seemed to be in incredible disarray 10 years ago yeah. with uh, the political changes, has now somehow rebounded. And as, as they become economically more viable, a lot of these businessmen have poured money into the hockey system. So we're getting a real rebirth in Russia. Finland has always been there and I think can produce more. Sweden has always been a great source of talent in the last 10 years, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia is an up-and-coming uh, hockey power. Uh, they won the world championship a couple of years ago. So it's, uh, it, it's nice to see that hockey is flourishing across some of these places. And one day, hopefully, we'll have a, an artificial ice surface that will introduce it easily to, to warmer climates. That's, a, that's something they've flirted with but haven't really quite been able to uh, perfect. Let's talk a little bit about the popularity of the sport. Why is hockey nationally less popular than other major league sports? Uh, the, in my opinion, the reason is that people don't play it in, yeah. the, in South Florida or, or Alabama. It's very expensive. Uh, there are no natural surfaces on which to play it. People, ball hockey is a tremendously popular game right now, but, but it's not ice hockey. And, to get a sheet of ice like this is this is a you know multi-million dollar facility, uh, so therein really lies the biggest rub that, that people just don't have access to the to the ice surfaces and the expensive the expensive nature of the equipment also is prohibitive. So that is going to keep us somewhat unfortunately contract. What advice would you have for kids that really want to make it in the NHL? Is it a realistic goal? Every kid has, should have a dream, and if, if that happens to be in athletics, I think they should be able to dream that. I think that the first thing that you need to do is learn how to skate. Uh, my advice really doesn't go to the, to the kids. It goes to the parents, where I think we've made a mockery of what we should be doing in, in uh, athletics, as far as, as far as hockey is concerned, anyway. We've got kids that are six and seven and eight that are on travel teams, traveling around two and three hours to play a 15-minute game. I know there's some socialization that occurs there, but that could happen a lot closer to home and for a lot less expense. And I think if we could, we could get more training into our early uh, hockey programs, more training, less travel, less game playing, right. and then, of course, less nonsense among parents in the stands, then I think we're much better off. And, and some of the European countries We've always known that they've been much better technically. Mm -hmm. It's because they're trained more, more thoroughly and properly. They don't play as many games. There's not as much emphasis on the games. So consequently, as they get older and do play more games, they're better prepared. And I think that's something that we should all look at. And, and my advice to the kids in general is learn to skate, learn, to, learn the skills, and then you'll get your game sense as time goes on. A kid, though, that wants to make it in the NHL, all they can do today is play hockey. They can't diversify themselves into other it's a sad, It's a yeah. sad comment, really, yeah. for me, but a specialization is here to stay, it looks like, and I think we just have to be careful. You can still, as a kid, play other sports, um, but the way things have been structured, there's, if you're part of a program, it starts in September. It doesn't end until April. There's off-season conditioning programs that they want, summer hockey schools that they want you to be a part of. It's tough. I still think there's a little room for it. But like anything else, if you put your mind to it, if you have it gifted with some, some natural ability, you've got a chance. But it's not something, professional sports is not something anybody can count on. This is, this is uh, your chances are remote that you'll make it, but it's... Uh, 
not un unfair or unwise to dream. And yeah, like you say, it's good to have a dream. Different question. Unlike other sports, hockey is much more reliant, in my opinion, on what I call ticket or gate income. What does that mean to the game? The, the reason why is simple. We, we have uh, never been able to expand to a regional or a national audience on a, on a great scale. Uh, the game is difficult to broadcast. Yeah. There's a very small object of everybody's attention. The puck is not very big. It's tough to see it, as, as you will note, or most people will note. But once you go to a game, you can get, you can get hooked on the thing. But oh, the, the, sure. The problem is that we have, a, we have enough issues in sort of selling it to the public, I guess. Somewhat related question. Do you think that hockey players now are going to start to look for the big salaries like other major league sports? It's already, it's already there. Yeah. yeah. As a business, I think it's safe to say that the, the case will be made by ownership that they can't afford it. And we're, we're paying more money in many cases to players than, than football and, and baseball and basketball for their marquee players. It's, it's, uh, it, it's not big money will come, it's big money is here. Right. And hockey has a unique problem, as I see it anyway, that you have a lot of teams out there that are losing money. And you have expansion of the NHL. And how does that all play into it? I think what happened here is that, that, that in the days of the 60s, 50s, 60s, and, and 70s, really, um, I think ownership took advantage of players. Mm -hmm. I think there was a real um, one-way street, and it, was, and it was not going the player's way. As the union changed, as, the, uh, as times changed, the union became much more powerful, much more in tune, and the pendulum swung the other way. Uh, now it's uh, the players that are in control. And consequently, there's a lack of trust between the two parties, and we'll say something, and they'll sneer, and they'll say something, and we'll say, can you believe they don't understand it? Until we get to some sort of understanding of each other's difficulties, and the fact that this is a business that requires obviously players and obviously the capital and the input of, of ownership and that we're a partnership, we're in for a rocky road. Right. So get on the same page. Yeah, it's a, that's the answer. Mm -hmm. There's obviously people want to come to the game. We play to mostly full houses. Um, as we mentioned earlier, it is, that's where we get our revenue. Um, so we've got something that people want to see, people want to watch on, on TV when they're familiar with the game. But we need to we need to know that we're we need each other in this whole business. Oh yeah, you look at Boston, you look here in New York. I mean, we love hockey, but that's not true everywhere. No, it isn't true everywhere because they haven't been introduced to it, and for the other reasons, the the lack of kid participation. But once you see it, once you're part of the action, once you actually get people to a game, you can really hook them. And uh, it would be a shame if we couldn't find a way as players and owners, to to and managers to come to some commonality without having a work stoppage for a length of time. Yeah, I mean, I wonder whether the NHL would survive long term some type of a lockout. Well, the, no matter how we try to screw it up, the game <laughs> keeps bouncing back. And, yes, it uh, does. And it's great. Let's talk a little bit about you. What was your experience? What has hockey meant to you? It's, it's been your whole life, as I can see it. And I had a dream like all other kids, but it was at a time when you played football and you played hockey and you played baseball and, and basketball and soccer and everything else you yeah. could get your hands on. So I, I, you know, as I headed off to college, I, I guess it was, the dream was still there, but I was being a little more realistic about, you know, options as a professional athlete. But when I get out of college, I got the opportunity to try out for the old Boston Braves um, and showed them enough to get me back to training camp in the fall. And then that, I got lucky enough to, to stick with the Bruins organization. A lot of it's luck, a lot of it's timing, a lot of it's hard work. I had a good fortune of having uh, Don Cherry, who was a big supporter of mine, and Harry Cinder, who was a great friend and mentor and who uh, has, has always meant the world to me in terms of, of personal and professional life. Uh, he gave me an opportunity to get my career started not only as a player, but then when it was over as a coach and manager in, in Portland. Uh, so it, it's just sort of popped up. It was there, and, and I've been able to take advantage of it. And it's been a great life for my, for my, my kids and my family, and it's uh, been fun. Everybody sort of rallies around, you know, whether it were the Bruins or now the Islanders. It's a, it's a way of sort of, 
you know, everybody getting on the same bandwagon. Mm -hmm. Even as a family, that's hard to do. So it's been a great ride for me. I've been privileged uh, to be part of the professional scene. You've done everything. What have been some of your favorite experiences? From a hockey standpoint, has been uh, it's been wonderful to get the chance to to play with a group of guys. I mean, even in the minor leagues, which was a different time in the early '70s. When I when I played, I played with guys like uh, that you won't recognize, like Harry Shaw, Rick Pagnuti, who played from September until April and then went home. And they were truck drivers or mailmen or whatever the case may be, but when they came to the rink, they gave it everything. They gave me a lot of experience, a lot of their time, and we had a ball. I mean, and the, uh, the American Hockey League was a great place to get started. And then, of course, playing in a city like Boston, when I came in, we went to the Stanley Cup Finals my first two years, and Stanley Cup Semifinals my third year, too many men on the ice against Montreal in 79 was an was a incredible experience, despite the fact that it ended somewhat bitterly. But to be playing in front of the hometown fans for the Bruins of, of Harry Sinden, Bobby Orr, Phil Esposito, Jerry Cheever's fame was a, a thrill in and of itself. The, the things that we did, the games that we played were, there's too many to enumerate, but I, I'll never forget being in that old barn, even just standing there for the national anthem and getting goosebumps every time we came out on the ice. It was. Uh, the whole thing still is a little surreal for me, and uh, I never, ever forget how lucky I've been to be part of the, the Boston sports scene. Joining me now is the NHL Rookie of the Year for the 1967-1968 season, Derek Turk Sanderson. Derek is well remembered as one of the finest four checkers to play the game and for setting up Bobby Orr's cup winner on May 10, 1970 with his pass behind the St. Louis goal. He played on one of the finest defensive lines in the game. Derek was also the first athlete from any sport to sign a contract in excess of $1 million. Derek, tell me how the game of hockey has changed since you've been a player with oh, the Boston wow. Bruins. Uh, see, I didn't read these questions, but that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The game is, I mean, vastly different, and if I can say, but it's really the same. Uh, at the, you know, when I played in the original six teams uh, for Boston, and they were, everybody was good. Two-way, positional, response time, you had no time to think out there. As expansion came in, it started to get watered down to the point defensively, not offensively. The skills have always been there. The goaltender's equipment has gotten a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. and there, so the numbers kind of stayed the same. And then this, the, the, the Patrick Waugh flop style goaltending shut off lower, uh, that started to creep in. Goaltenders have become very, very good. And there's been an explosion in that area of talent. Uh, offensively, the Europeans have come in. The Americans have tremendous contributions in the Kachuks and the uh, you know, Stevens is, and these guys that can play Barrasso and goal and, and so, and Roenick, and they, they're just tremendous talent. Uh, so expansion was something that had to take place. And uh, I think somewhere along the lines, they forgot about the defensive aspect of the game, mm -hmm. about both ends of the building. That's all. They have, they're, the players are bigger, stronger, better shape, uh, and, but uh, they're not faster. It's just, just the game is played at a certain speed. And uh, I think it's a great game. My sons love it, uh, and I've always loved hockey. And whether it changes it, but it's kind of stayed the same. There's still only a few things you can do to get out of your own end. A little bit of a different question. Has the NHL expanded too far? Have we diluted the talent pool too much? What they have, when you bring in the, when you bring in the uh, Europeans, yeah. uh, they're a very skilled offensive set of players. Uh, they p are used to playing a schedule that is not nearly as long. So they have dreadful slumps sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when it's moved up a couple of notch in the Stanley Cup, they haven't made that acclamation yet. The Canadian the North American players and, and the Canadian American players have, but the European has to get there yet. And once that takes place, it'll be, it'll be terrific. Do you believe that the violence or the fighting is essential to the game? Is that what the viewers want? Absolutely. Yeah. Hockey is not for everyone. Uh, I wish the National Hockey League would learn how to market the game. Yeah. 
I it agree. is not for everybody, Diane. It's a game that is a physical, it's a violent game played by violent people. Uh, and you're going to get hit. You know you're going to get hit, and you're going to get hit hard. You're going to bleed. You're going to lose teeth. Things are going to happen to you. Uh, and you accept that when you sign your contract. Fighting is a, is a essential part. You have a club in your hands. Frustration it gets to such a level when the guy's hooking you and grabbing you and slowing you down, impeding your progress, when you're not allowed to touch a player without the puck. And they would just call the rules, it would be terrific, but they don't. And so now a player gets frustrated, he starts to slash and spear and using the stick as a weapon. You're far better off dropping the gloves than having at it with fisticuffs. It's over, it's very aerobic, it's usually over in four, <laughs> 45, 50 seconds. Uh, you're balanced on a 16th inch of steel off of yeah. frozen water. I mean, how strong can you be? So you, you're ripping guys, it's a lot of wrestling, but I think it, it gets out frustrations. That keeps the level of violence down. Hockey players are great athletes, though, and I think we lose sight of just how talented a hockey player is. I do, I do firmly believe that. When you look at, at, at the NFL and football, as good as they are, the quarterback and the running backs and, 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 and the defensive backs, those are the skill positions. But the, most of it is just in the trenches, hitting hard, moving, uh, and they don't go very far. Uh, hockey is a game that is played by uh, uh, offense can hit defense. Uh, there's no out of bounds. Mm -hmm. There's no set rules. I don't have possession like in basketball. I'll give you the ball, except for the jump ball. It's, uh, I've got possession. Hockey is dropped. It's anybody's puck. Uh, so uh, there's no set plays. It's a game of ad lib. It's an entirely different game. Uh, when the puck changes hands, and, and you don't have it, and the puck changes hands, your job changes. And you have to be able to read that. If you can't read that, I can't coach that. You have to have the sense for the game. If you don't, then you can go up and down the wall, mind your own business, and probably have an okay career if you're really talented. But <laughs> the art of it is in understanding the game. Why isn't hockey as popular as other sports? Is it that it is hard to follow on TV, that you really have to be at the rink to really enjoy the game? Well, those are two very good points. The puck is too small, even for TV. Uh, so when you, I mean, they come up with that silly laser puck, remember that one? Okay. <laughs> and that was in the stands sometimes, people going. Uh, but when you look at hockey, and, and the puck being so small, it's actually a game that you have to be there to feel the energy. Uh, I've watched it. Uh, I think they do a far better game today. With They make it exciting today on television. And ESPN's done a marvelous job, as the, and, and all the stations have. Uh, well, you did a marvelous job. When we, and when we, we played, right, when we played, I, I remember when I did, watched the highlights of Bobby Orr, showing it to my sons one day. And my wife and I were sitting there, and I said, Whoa, we look slow. Were we that slow? And she said, yeah, it does look kind of slow. <laughs> and I went to the game that night, and I spoke with Fred Cusick, who was probably the greatest broadcaster ever, came down the pike. And I said, Fred, is it really, are we, we, we are that slow? He said, no, when, when you played, Derek, in that era, it was one camera game. It was at center ice, 30 feet off the ice, uh, and it panned, and yeah. it's all it did. And so the downtime through center ice has now changed. They have 48 cameras now. They take a guy's hands, feet, bang, this player breaking, that player breaking, no puck. You don't see the puck half the time. And they take you through the coming out of your own end through center ice until you're around the net. Then they pan out and see some action. So it's actually the producer, the director, how they pick the camera, the shots, and they make it very exciting. And they make it look faster, but it, it, it really is. So how do we increase the popularity? I think you market the people that, that, that love it and the people that like it. Boston fans. Yeah, you just really pay attention to your fan base. Mm -hmm. uh, let the let the Bruins grow out and reach the community. Columbus, Atlanta, reach the community. Go out and, and, and street hockey. Uh, I mean, you got wonderful equipment for kids. Franklin Manufacturing has a whole line of f street equipment. So you get the kids into, into street hockey. Then you get them onto the ice and you get them feeling better about it. But the teams have got to go out into the community and take all the suburbs and, 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 sure. and those hotbeds were 30, 31 cities. I mean, you, that's all you need. And mark it out from the building and then start to develop a fan base. The National Hockey League excludes its fan base. They go to general. They go to some ad, say, watch hockey, it's the coolest game in the world. <laughs> well, if I'm sitting in, uh, you know, Peoria, Illinois, I'm going, oh, it's a, you go to the, you get familiarity, get the players out in the community and start to market it. Is hockey, though, accessible to most kids? No. 
No. Too expensive. Yeah, it is. It's an extremely expensive game. Uh, gold pads are up to $1,000, $1,200. Uh, the, the gloves are, are, are state of the art now, wonderful equipment. Kids are better protected than they ever were. Maybe more so. Not enough fluidity, not enough movement, not enough ability to get out of the way because you're so encumbered with equipment. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's, it's a different game with the, with the equipment in that aspect. There. What advice would you have for kids in the audience that think, you know, one day I'm going to play in the NHL? Well, I was, that was a dream that I had. I, I, the, the Boston Bruins bought me when I was 10 years old. And uh, it was professional rights for $100, and that's what they did in the old days. Follow your dream. If you're a young kid and, and, and you want to play, you've got to think it all the time, though. It isn't something you can do part-time. No, not anymore. You're not going to make the Red Sox right? part-time. You're not going to make the Patriots part-time, Celtics part-time. You've you got to think about it all the time. Your diet, your, your decision-making, your, your building your body, getting your rest. Uh, what your, you know, your, your, uh, it's just all-encompassing now. Athletes today are in tremendous shape. Yes, they are. Well, we're talking about players, something that I'm personally intrigued about. You think of hockey as being an aggressive sport, as a violent sport, but yet we rarely, if ever, hear about hockey players being in trouble, not like other athletes. Why do you think that's so? I have always had kind of a personal opinion. I think it's hockey and all the campuses in the United States and all the junior teams in Canada and all the Europeans Hockey is a game of humility. Hockey, I tell you, to play it, you humbled time after time, shift after shift, by other people's talents or jobs or just whatever. But it, it, there's, there's no uh, social set like on campus. Big man on campus in high school. Yeah. There's no cheerleaders. There's no, uh, you're special. But football and basketball in America is treated special. The athlete starts to believe that. He starts to walk around like he just owns everything. Let's talk about Derek today. Uh, first of all, that was the farthest thing from my mind was ever to be in the investment business. <laughs> but when I was playing, uh, and I was fortunate, as we spoke earlier about the uh, uh, free agency and the WHA and making all that money, I went to uh, my lawyer and he took me to a, an investment firm and he got power of attorney and I was taken advantage of. I, yes, I did a lot of foolish things on my own but I didn't spend all the money, uh, so it's gone. And I did not want to have that happen to any other player, you know. And uh, I did the Tucker Anthony Golf Classic, and John Goldsmith was the chairman of Tucker Anthony, and Clyde Fasioli uh, brought me on board, and then John Goldsmith encouraged me to go back to get my Series 7, understand the industry. I did, and then I realized that it's basically an industry of all the money management, the brokers, and everybody's pretty talented. What do you pay me? What do you charge me? And what do you give me? What do you do for that? And it's basically what I wanted to, a fee-based sports group. I wanted to protect the athlete, number one, from himself, and number two, take him out of the hands of the Philistines, take him away from the people that would take advantage of him and, and overpower him. And so the athlete spent so much time on his game that he doesn't, he or she does not spend a lot of time on their financial life. Right. And I figured if I could be an agent, supportive, uh, financial arm, uh, and responsibly, prudently manage money and wealth, it would be an added service. And it was, uh, I started it about 10 years ago. It's been extremely successful. I've made, I moved a couple of, uh, from a couple of firms for services. And, uh, and I started in the business with Jay Henderson, who's the president here uh, of the investment side. Uh, so, uh, senior vice president. And Jay and I have known each other for 11 years, and I said to him, I would like to, you know, talk about my athletes being here, because this is a wonderful firm to have your money managed. It's very simple, high service, high touch, high technology, but always a warm body. And that's what the players needed. Sure. Education, compassion, understanding where they're not embarrassed to ask a question. They don't feel foolish about, uh, uh, you know, mailing or forgetting stuff. You know how your bank or whatever the bank, they get mad at you. <laughs> it's my money, they get mad at me. I said, well, I made a mistake. <laughs> Joining me now is a Hall of Famer hockey writer, the longtime Lawrence Eagle Tribune sports editor, Russ Conway. 
Russ was a nominee for a Pulitzer Prize in recognition of his outstanding investigative journalism, and he was the 1999 recipient of the Elmer Ferguson Memorial Award, as selected by the Professional Hockey Writers Association. He is the author of Game Misconduct, Alan Eagleson, and the Corruption of Hockey. Russ, welcome to the show. My pleasure. Delighted to have you here. Russ, you've been covering hockey a number of years. Tell us how the game has changed over the course of time. <laughs> <laughs> the game hasn't changed. It's what's gone on around it. The business end is entirely different. Uh, the players are bigger, stronger, faster. Not necessarily as skilled. Yeah. But the business part of hockey, as in all of professional sports, is basically the uh, engine that runs the locomotive. Why haven't hockey salaries escalated like other sports salaries? Oh, they have. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting there. <laughs> but still less than other, other sports athletes are receiving. They've caught up. They, yeah. could, they really have caught up. I mean, you must remember uh, that there are 30 teams. There are roughly 700 players that are on rosters. Uh, and each team also fields at least one minor league team. Uh, the overall salaries, which are the big bite uh, for a, a, the price of a ticket, uh, are the single number one reason why tickets have absolutely shot through the roof. People think, right or wrong, that hockey players are aggressive, they're fighters. But you never hear, or rarely do you hear, I should say, about hockey players getting in trouble. Why is that? I think there's a real good reason for that. Most hockey players, their upbringing is either in a low class, a low middle class income bracket. Mm -hmm. Very few hockey players uh, are well to do when they first break into high school or college. Now, right. by the same token, it's a very expensive sport to play. And these kids really have a work ethic. Uh, I think originally that is probably in a, uh, stems from the Canadian upbringing. I mean, for years in Canada, I mean, people were brought up to appreciate things. Uh, they, they remember their roots. That's one thing I like about hockey players today and always. If there's a tradition off the ice, they have been some of the most generous when it comes to charities and in community involvement. Popularity of the sport. Why is it that hockey is not as popular as some of the other sports? Is it because it's low scoring, hard to follow on TV? Uh, a little bit of that. They've really made great strides in their telecast. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they went to Canada and basically uh, took the uh, work ethic and, and the type of production that they did in Canada finally brought it to the States and they've done a much better job with it in the last few years. But you must remember by its own definition there isn't a lot of ice in southeastern or southwestern United States. Now the NHL, to Gary Bettman's credit, uh, has slowly worked its way into different regions that had never seen hockey before. That's right, yeah. I mean, the Florida Panthers, uh, I know when they made it to the Stanley Cup Finals, South Florida went absolutely crazy for them. And uh, they built a brand new rink. Whoever thought you'd see an NHL rink in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Sunrise, Florida, another one in Tampa, brand new rink just come in Phoenix. Uh, that, you know, that has brought more people to the game. There are more hockey fans today than ever. But has the league expanded too far? That's a great question. Uh, sometimes I think it has. Mm -hmm. And yet, in order to, in order to find your level, uh, you, you, you've got to be able to see how far you can go. We tend to think of hockey as a violent or an aggressive sport. So I have a couple of questions. First question is, is the violence and the fighting essential to the game? Do the fans really want to see it? I uh, cringe every time people say it's violent. 
the NBA, they have these bench clearing brawls all the time. And even in the N uh, NFL. And if you watch a Major League Baseball season, how many are there? <laughs> I mean, you know, 20, 25 a season. Uh, I don't find it violent. When it's a contact sport. Mm -hmm. And whenever you have two people going 25 to 30 mile an hour, and they crash into each other. Is that other. how fast they go, Russ? Sometimes, wow. 20, 28 miles an hour on skates you could reach. And you, uh, you, know, you have a little disc, a rubber disc, mm -hmm. that you're winging 95 miles an hour. Some players can wing it up to 100 miles mm -hmm. an hour. <laughs> I mean, you know, some people are going to get hurt. It's not for the, uh, uh, the sissies, that's for sure. Are hockey players, in your opinion, becoming too greedy at the expense of the league? Are they in it for just themselves and not considering the longevity of the league? I don't think all players are like that. Mm -hmm. By the same token, all owners aren't like that either. You must remember, a player is offered X amount of dollars. And I'll use Bill Guerin as an example yeah. that played here in Boston. The owner of the Dallas Stars offered him five-year contract for $45 million. Mm -hmm. Now, what would you do? He'd be a fool not to sign that, yeah. to take it. That was a guaranteed contract. He took care of his family, his grandkids, his own kids, his grandkids, and whatever generations there are to come. The owners in some areas have been their own worst enemies. What about revenue sharing? What can we do to have a better equity? They have a slight revenue uh, sharing program, but you've got to lose X amount of dollars for the Canadian teams, and mm -hmm. that was because of the dollar, the U.S. dollar, uh, versus the Canadian dollar. The exchange rates were just out of sight yeah. for a long while, and all NHL players are played, paid in U.S. dollars. Well, it's pretty difficult for the Calgary Flames or the Vancouver Canucks, uh, Toronto, uh, Montreal, etc., to compete when they're paying their payroll in U.S. dollars, but their income is derived in Canadian dollars. Sure. Uh, it's amazing some of them held on. Ottawa was in big trouble mm -hmm. for a while. If they really want to look at it positively for the sport, for the fan, for the player, for the owner, the owners are entitled to make a profit. I mean, they have an investment. Sure. That's why they're in the business. Right. The players are entitled, the good ones, are entitled to be paid good professional sports money. But in order to bring those two together, you've got to look and say, are we going to be partners? Because you must remember, they do not have the television contract that the other three major league sports have. Yes, that's exactly what I wanted to ask you. They don't have the TV, the merchandising, the other, you know, the other sponsorship revenue that all the other sports have. TV is the big issue. Yeah. TV, for example, in the in the NFL, basically pays the payroll, the player salary payroll. Right. Uh, if you look at NASCAR, I mean, oh, NASCAR okay. got yeah. two point eight billion dollars for its television commitment for uh, the course of five years. That pays the purses that those drivers sure. go at each different track, basically takes care of the whole purse. In the NHL, the TV revenue in Canada and the U United States it doesn't come close. You know, local, local TV pays separately right. for clubs, but the TV revenue doesn't come close. Now. Their merchandising and marketing has been really well done. It's a billion dollar business. Uh, the NHL and their teams have done a great job. They've, they've come up with revenue sources that they never had before. Mm -hmm. But they had to. Sure they do. To exist. Uh, I think at the end of the day, they've got to say, what is the value of a franchise? The value, the hockey rink if the Boston Bruins didn't play there? Sure. The answer is? No. No? Right. And you've got to go further than just the hockey rink to see what the hockey team is responsible for in terms of revenue. Right. 
the answer no longer can be to raise ticket prices because, uh, I mean, I think we're at... It's tapped the, out. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty much tapped out, other than maybe cost of living or whatever. Boston uh, it takes a bad knock for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Harrison has done a pretty good job putting a cap on tickets the best they can. It used to be, not long ago, that ticket revenue paid the salaries of the players. And pretty much every dollar that's spent by a fan ends up going back into salary. So you, you, you're about tapped out. You can't keep jacking the ticket prices. Last question. Tell us about your book. Tell us about your investigative work. Well, the Eagle Tribune uh, and its publisher at the time, uh, Irving Rogers, Jr., uh, and editors uh, were totally supportive. Uh, I had a number of players come to me with various suspicions, various complaints, both current and past players, uh, of where their international hockey money was going, about their pensions. They had questions. They couldn't get answers. Mm -hmm. And basically, Eagleson wouldn't service them. Uh, he'd shut you out, browbeat you, and we went after it. Uh, had total support. We did eight different series in the Eagle Tribune. I had a number of publishing companies come to me, asked to do a book. We conducted that investigation. The FBI got involved, Justice Department, the Mounties, and it became an international uh, event, so to speak, that certainly took a lot of patience and uh, a lot of support. Uh, it was no one person, but it was quite a, uh, an experience to go through. I, I said during the, during the saga, and finally went to jail, went to prison, I said, you know, I hope there's some life left after this thing's over. <laughs> and uh, justice was served. Uh, 1,343 players got pension money back. Uh, Eagleson was fined. He, he was exposed. Uh, he was kicked out of the hockey Hall of Fame, so to speak. He resigned because he had to under pressure. Uh, he was kicked out of the Order of Canada. Uh, and uh, people in Canada, certainly around the sport, know uh, that he was a fraud and he was a crook. And we were able to uh, uncover it. Well, you know, terrific job. You've heard that a million times, I know. But as I prepare for the show and I'm talking with various people, everybody is so grateful to you. Well, I appreciate that. Okay. Joining me now is former Boston College and NHL player Ken Hodge. Ken was drafted by the Minnesota North Stars in the 1984 draft. Ken played with the North Stars as well as the Boston Bruins before retiring with Tampa Bay. Welcome to the show, Ken. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me, Diane. Ken is joined by his attorney, Kenneth Lakin. He has represented a number of professional athletes over the years. Ken, great to see you again. Diane, it's always a pleasure to see you. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Ken, let's start with you. How has the game of hockey changed in the past two decades? Has it become a game of speed and strength as opposed to skill? Uh, well, the easiest answer to that one would be the money, I think, is the biggest, biggest change. <laughs> it's changed from, to a game of money, yeah. You know, you go back to the year of the, uh, the 70s uh, when my dad played, uh, they only made maybe twenty-five to $50,000 per season, which was big money back then. Yeah. Um, then when I went in in the 90s, it was, you know, guys were making a million dollars, which was probably you know, the, the top end guy, and, and then after that, it's been, you know, if you, if you don't make more than a million dollars as a low end guy, then it's something <laughs> seriously wrong. But wow. uh, you can also look at the, 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 the size of some of these guys, uh, there's some 6'4 guys with the average size, and uh, size, strength, and speed is a big big attribute for that hockey, for playing hockey now. Big part of the game today. I mean, absolutely is, and, uh, and that's, if you don't have that size and speed, you're not going to play. Wow. Ken, is it the lawyer, is it the agent, is it the representative of the player that's responsible for this escalating salary problem? I, I, I'm often asked that question, <laughs> both not only the NHL, but the NFL as a representative of NFL players over the years. You know, there's a lot of factors that get involved with it. Um, Commissioner Getman has done a great job of bringing the, uh, bringing the league out and licensing and advertising the league at different levels. The problem has been that a lot number of teams have spent money stupidly or unnecessarily, and that's created a quagmire. Obviously, the TV revenues has composed to, yeah. to the other to the other sports is a significant issue that the NHL has to face. But 
the players and their agents and their lawyers who represent them are out to get them what they can get them. And if a team's going to pay them money for that and their services there, it's a free market system they're entitled to get there. That, that's, the, that's the foundation of the whole country as a capitalist. But system. does it become a situation of personal greed over really the, the security of the league? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't classify it as greed. It's, okay. it, it's not greed. It's, it's, there's revenues that are there, and each team's different. You, you take teams like Otto uh, and, and Buffalo and Atlanta that have had significant, the, the first two were in bankruptcy, significant issues. But the other teams like the Rangers and other big market teams have done very, very well. It's up to the individual owner and their management team and the player and the agent involved to get the value for that player. And if the player is going to draw in people in that particular um, location in that particular team, mm -hmm. then that person should be rightly compensated. But it's not the role of the player or the agent or the lawyer to be into the into the management game for different for different cities and different teams. That's their responsibility. Is the violence and the aggressiveness an essential part? Well, of I think the game? it is because uh, you, you have to have some some kind of fear factor in the hockey in hockey, and, and you hate to see, use those words, but. Uh, when you're not intimidating somebody, maybe that's better, a better ter terminology. Mm -hmm. Then you're, they're going to have the, they're going to have the upper hand on you, and that's kind of what hockey is. It's an intimidation game. Uh, I, I've seen recently. I, I, I hate to keep going back to the early '70s and, and '60s, but they have bench clearing brawls on, on a night in and night out basis. Uh, now uh, I think you can count on the number on one finger the number of times in the last 10 years that there's been a bench clearing brawl. They've tried to cut that out of the game, which I think is a good thing. Um, but yet, there's still the intimidation factor. There's still these, uh, again, uh, you, six four guys. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to lay a body check on a, on a six foot guy. It's going to be intimidating. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you have to drop the gloves, and now all of a sudden, here you go, and now you got to fight these guys. And uh, it, it, you have to have some t some type of intimidation to be able to play this game. The viewers love the fights, though. Well, they do, and uh, I think. Uh, some of the bigger players, uh, like Mario Lemieux and, mm -hmm. and Wayne Gretzky, when they were prominent in the league, were trying to cut it out because it, I think the, the league it went through a, a period of uh, where a team would win games one nothing, uh, right. two to one, and the fans weren't as in, intra, into the hockey game as they as they are now when you see some more goals. So the big guys, the bigger named guys like Lemieux and Gretzky and, and even Brett Hull to a, to an extent, uh, advocated to get fighting out of the game. And that's exactly what happened for a little while, but it's slowly creeping its way back in. Why isn't, in your opinion, hockey as popular as other major league sports? I mean, I read reports that say, well, the viewers find it hard to follow on TV, or the fact that it is low scoring is problematic for people's interests. I, I think there's two factors. I think one is it, it, the speed of the game on TV. It doesn't come across as if you were actually at a game mm -hmm. to see how fast these guys are actually skating. And I think also, too, the second thing was when they came in with helmets, you don't get to see the guy's face as much. Now the guys wear face shields. Some guys wear, um, you know, full face cages when they're injured. Obviously, with you know, it, so you don't really get to see the player and identify with that player. And and when that player is in one city, he might not be there for more than a you know a year. And all of a sudden, he's playing somebody somewhere else. So that's another part of the the name and face recognition that you don't have anymore as much as you had back in the early 70s. Right. I think another issue on, on along those lines also is that hockey, unlike some of the other main sports, is kind of a regional sport. The Northeast and the Midwest in particular, you get out to the West and the Southwest and the South, it's not nearly as popular. But isn't it interesting the teams are expanding down there? I mean, you played in Tampa Bay. Right. It, you know, it's, it, they were trying to get into a different market. I think hockey was trying to get, grab some different places and try to get some different, uh, some, establish some roots. Uh, when I was in Tampa Bay, I mean, we had a uh, 15,000 seat uh, building we were at, and it was the first year of the, of the team. They'd maybe have maybe 5,000 fans were cheering for us, wow. and 10,000 fans were cheering for the other team that was coming in. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you think about it, you got wow. a lot of Canadians, sure. a lot of northern people go down to Canada, or down to Tampa rather, and spend their, their winters down there. Sure. They're not rooting for the lightning. They could care less about the lightning. And so they they, yeah, they can't get tickets up north, so they're going right. to well, see the their same, favorite team. You teams. see what happens with the Red Sox and the Red yeah. Sox. So the Yankees play down, and the same thing happens. Yeah. You know, I don't try to try to diss Tampa Bay. My brother John lives down in Tampa Bay. I never try to diss his area. <laughs> but basically, what's happening is the larger market teams, not only in the NHL but in a lot of the other other sports as well, is that these large markets are subsidizing these teams that maybe should not have a pro team. Maybe they should have a Triple A team or a minor league, but not a pro team because that cuts into the overall revenue issues that we addressed earlier right. when you're supporting a Nashville you know or Tampa Bay these areas are Columbus that that are you know 
arguably not major market areas that should have major proteins and, and it's to some extent indirectly siphoning some of the revenues of the overall, overall NHL um, and I, uh, coffers, and I think that's an issue. I really do. Well, I think the to address that issue. I wonder, in light of what Ken just said about unless you're really at the game, you don't appreciate all of the skill and, and the beauty of the game unless you're there because it's lost on TV. But how does one go when tickets are $70, $90? How do you take your two kids in to see the Boston Bruins? Got to have good friends that have a lot of tickets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, does he have tickets? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. My, my firm had season tickets for a number of years. We couldn't give them away to clients. So we don't have ticket season tickets anymore because if I need to send a client to a particular game, I could just go buy two tickets and send them to the game. I think the issue, that's a, that's a quagmire. There, the increase in NHL tickets has been 81% in the last 10 years. And they, they've, 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 they've optimized their growth level it's, at this point. But y the ticket is $75, but that's the, that just gets you into your seat. Right, right. good I mean, point. You, you're looking at, you got to pay $20 or $25 to park your car down the Fleet Center now. And that's not even, that's in the, the lower garage where you might not even get a spot down there first off. And then when you get into the building, now you're going to pay $5 for a hot dog, you know, $5 for a soda. By an average family of four, by the time they get to the hockey game, it's 500 bucks to get wow. home. I mean, and they it, can't do that. They, they can't. I mean, especially with the economics the way they are nowadays, uh, you just can't afford to take a family on a consistent basis on a, an 82 game season that is 41 home dates. You, you can barely go once or twice a season to go to a game and spend a thousand dollars. Right, and hockey, unlike Major League Baseball, unlike football, unlike most of the other sports, heavily dependent from the numbers I've looked at at that gate or that ticket income to pay their biggest expense, which is in fact player salaries. So, what's the hockey league going to do to attract more sponsorship or more TV contracts or do something to bring down the the ticket price? Well, I think there's a couple of issues there. The, when you look at um, how hockey has to draw, I, I personally think they have to downsize the league. I think it's just too, too, too big of a league. A couple of large markets and, and strong geographical areas and then to, and, and try to therefore then cut down some of the ticket prices across the board. They learned, I think they need to do a much more better job in marketing, doing merchandising, licensing rights and things of that. And it's like the NFL, you look at the NFL Players Association, they've done a tremendous job on that. The, the, the NFL in general has done a tremendous job of attracting a new market of people, maybe going overseas um, into the European markets and the Asian markets and doing things like that in order to attract more money to bring it into the league. But I think the way that the league is structured now and given that the TV contract is is laughable. I happened to be playing at the time when Gary Bettman became the, the commissioner. He came in from the NBA, and the NBA was just at its height of its popularity when you had mm -hmm. Bird and Magic and all those guys were coming into the height of their popularity. Well, he said, let's do the same thing. That, let's try to take that model of the NBA and let's bring it over to the NHL. It doesn't work because, as you mentioned before, they got the helmets and they don't have the name recognition, and the guys are constantly moving back and forth. That's that's hockey's got to kind of do its own thing and not worry about the NBA, the NFL, or the Major League Baseball. They've got to start worrying about themselves. Joining me now from the Sports Museum here in Boston, Massachusetts, is Richard Johnson. He's fondly known as the soul man of Boston sports. Dick, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Dick, did you have a favorite uh, hockey team or a favorite hockey player when you were a kid growing up? Well, the Bruins of the Bobby Orr, Phil Esposito era were as charismatic a group uh, that have ever played any sport in any league. Uh, they were just, you know, the team, and and they were that was the team of my youth, and uh, and and the team that made me a big hockey fan. Great. Let's look at the evolution of the game. Tell us a little bit how it began as the original six, and take us up to current. Well, it was interesting that hockey had had deep roots in the New England area long before the start of the National Hockey League. You had hockey being played at St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire in the 1890s. Wow. The collegiate uh, hockey leagues uh, started uh, pretty soon after that, so I believe uh, Harvard's program started also in the 1890s. So the sport really uh, is, uh, I think, the one closest to our hearts here because there have been more professionals that have come from the New England area in hockey than in any other sport. And then certainly uh, the great number of uh, Olympic players, the great high school tradition here. This is also the home of the first interscholastic hockey league in the country, dating back to the 19-teens. And uh, the Boston Arena, now known as Matthews Arena, 
is the oldest indoor ice arena in the world. Wow, did not know that. And that's still here. That. That's where the Bruins started back in 1924. So the origins uh, of hockey in this area go back to the origins of the sport itself. It helps get us through these New England winters, I think. That's why we love it so much. Yes. D different question. Is the violence or the fights of the game essential to people being attracted to watching hockey? No, I don't think so, because in collegiate hockey, fighting is punished with a game suspension. So the, anyone that's watched top-level collegiate hockey knows that it's as good as it gets and you don't need the fighting, it's a distraction. But that being said, <laughs> certain teams had as part of their identity a fighting mode to them. Uh, certainly the Bruins had that for a number of years. You know, they were a tough team, they were a team to be contended with at, at all times. And the fighting was almost a part of the script. The Flyers of the early 70s sort of took a page out of the Bruins book and tried to intimidate opponents as well as outplay them. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I think anyone that's watched enough hockey knows that when it's played well, it's a beautiful sport, and the fighting tends to delay it, it tends to be a distraction, and in this day and age, uh, there are not many teams that can really intimidate you anymore. The game has changed a bit. It's a more flowing sport, and uh, skating skill and overall talent really are what you pay to see. You don't pay to see a couple of goons out there slugging <laughs> it out. Hockey players are great athletes. Yes. Why haven't hockey salaries escalated like other sports salaries? Well, uh, hockey, professional hockey, the National Hockey League in particular, just does not receive the television income that the other major sports, you know. They really, we really think of there being as four major sports in North America. The National Football League has the biggest TV contract. They also have the most players to pay, but you know they're paid on an average higher than the National Hockey League players. The NBA has a larger TV contract, Major League Baseball. Uh, there's certain individual clubs in MLB that, that get paid an enormous amount, teams such as the Yankees. So the National Hockey League has always been the fourth of the four major sports in terms of pay, just because the money's not there. The money has to derive from ticket income, and you can only charge so much. And is it accurate to say that much of the, the gate income, as I call it, the ticket income, is paid out, in fact, for salaries? That's where they spend the bulk of the money. Well, they claim that nearly 74, 75 percent of uh, player salary comes from ticket income, and I believe it. And the fact is, is that certain teams charge an extraordinary amount. I was at a game in Toronto uh, two years ago and the price for individual tickets in the Loge, good seats but not great seats, was $162.50 oh, wow. a piece. Now that's Canadian but still that would be about $110 uh, American currency for one hockey game and this was against the Nashville Predators, not exactly a classic contest. Yeah. So that's what they're up against and uh, the league is really at the point now where uh, I can't imagine them possibly increasing prices any more than they have. Let me ask a different question. Why do you think hockey is not as popular throughout the nation as other sports? Is it that it's low scoring or hard to follow on television or is there some other reason? Well, I think the popularity of, of any sport is based on whether or not kids have played it. So that in most of the country, kids have just never put the skates on and gone out and played hockey. It's as simple as that. The other factor that really has an impact on the game not being as popular as the other sports, it's so expensive. Yeah. Just to outfit uh, a squirt player, you're spending upwards of four or five hundred dollars. Dick, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you.